this on. Okay, so she'll start the line here. So, Gina, this is really a live stream of that from Derry Beach City, the Fishing Chamber of City Hall. And we'll talk a little bit about the basis for it. We've both been introduced to elected officials and introduced to Department of Direct. This is Derry Beach, the Central Service Operation Commission Manager from the Government. This is just the first in a series of things that we're planning to help educate our residents right. on how yeah. municipalities work. Right, of course. So let me ask you this. This is, um, in addition to the live stream, do you have a specific format in mind to yes. connect with everybody? Yeah. What would yeah. that be called exactly? It's going to be a, a series of different um, social media um, initiatives that we're going to be putting out over the next few months to just continue our residents' education on how cities work and what Delray Beach does as a full service municipality. And that's exactly right. So I got it. Something coming up. to ask everybody to settle down and all that, so. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Terrence Moore, Derry Beach City Manager for the past eight months and nearly two weeks, and Interestingly enough, I've been having a really good experience thus far, a lot of work in which to accomplish, and what we have in store for you this evening is a first of a number of educational series relative to how local government operates here in the state of Florida, which is also applicable for other parts of the country as well. As Delray Beach City Manager, I actually function as the city's chief executive officer. To that point, the city of Delray Beach, like most other cities throughout the United States and other industrialized countries around the world, operate via what is known as the council or a commission manager form of government, where the elected body, being the mayor and the city commission in the case of Delray Beach, Florida, appoints a well-trained, well-educated, sometimes in theory, but I think in my case I'm okay, individual to run day-to-day -day operations of the city, which is likewise my role. Despite being on board in Delray Beach to this effect for the last eight plus months, I've actually been a city manager for the past 23 consecutive years. First in Florida, New Mexico, West Virginia, most recently metropolitan Atlanta, Georgia, and the appointment to Delray Beach, Florida is my return to Florida and likewise South Florida. This is a wonderful treat simply because also this opportunity does involve collaboration with the Florida League of Cities. Not long after my arrival last summer into early fall, I did speak to a couple elected officials who had expressed an interest in us doing as much as we possibly can as a municipality to update and educate residents and stakeholders relative to how local government operates. The primary focus in this regard, again, it is a streaming event to be formatted for other social media engagements and other electronic medium to enable residents and stakeholders to become thoroughly and intimately familiar with the city of Delray Beach as a municipal operation. We likewise have several other presentations in store. In addition to Lynn Tipton of the Florida League of Cities, we also have asked partners from the Downtown Development Authority to be here, Laura Simon, who's the Executive Director, along with the Delray Beach Community Redevelopment Agency, Ms. Renee Jadasingh, who is the Executive Director of that organization. What you find is that Delray Beach is a robust full service operation. A near total fund budget of $300 million, including utilities, various other enterprise fund operations, and a pretty robust general fund. Before I proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the elected officials who thought it was important to be part of this exercise, again, the first in a number of series that we hope to execute in the coming months. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mayor Shirley Petrolio, Shelly Petrolia, ladies and gentlemen, if we can acknowledge her, please. 
We also have with us Vice Mayor Adam Frankel. Vice Mayor Adam Frankel. We also have with us Deputy Vice Mayor Julie Cassell. Julie Cassell. <laughs> Commissioner Ryan Boston, strong advocate for this type of initiative. Thank you, sir. And last but certainly not least, Commissioner Shirley Johnson. Shirley Johnson. I will also acknowledge the various department directors to provide a sense as to the full service operation that is the city of Delray Beach. First of all, Assistant City Manager Jeffrey Orris is here. Jeffrey Orris. <laughs> Director of Finance Hugh Dunkley, recently joined the organization. <laughs> Representing the Delray Beach Police Department, we have Assistant Chief Russ Major with us this evening. Russ Major. <laughs> Fire Chief, Fire Rescue Chief. Keith Tommy, <laughs> Director of Public Works, Missy Barletto, <laughs> Director of Development Services, Anthea Geniotis, <laughs> Director of Communications, Gina Carter, <laughs> Director of Parks and Recreation, Sam Mitat, <laughs> Director of Utilities, Hassan Hajimiri, Education Coordinator, Janet Meeks. <laughs> Sustainability Officer, Ken Edwards. <laughs> Our City Clerk is here, Kateri Johnson. <laughs> Director of Information Technology, Jay Stacy. <laughs> and I believe that covers the introductions as a whole. So followed by Lynn Tipton and her illustrious presentation regarding the role and function of local government operations, we will also have experiences from both Laura Simon, representing the Downtown Development Authority, as well as Renee Jado Singh, the Derry Beach Community Redevelopment Agency. Let's give it up, please, for Ms. Lynn Tipton, who was gracious enough to help us facilitate this program this evening. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Before you get started, can we switch mics? Is that one not working as well? Yeah. Okay, all right. Is this a better sound? Oh good, I should have asked that, but thank you so much. So who is the Florida League of Cities? We get asked if we're a state agency. What branch are you? You're over all the cities, you tell them what to do? No. We're a voluntary member association. It happens to be our 100th birthday. A group of officials back in 1922 got together in Tampa and said, we need to speak with one united voice. We're having a hard time with the legislature. 
a hundred years later, that story really hasn't changed that much, but all the cities can at least speak and have spoken for the last hundred years with one voice. Our first name was Florida League of Municipalities. Can anybody spell municipality, let alone tell you on what is outside of a constitution, right? So in 1970, we changed our name to the Florida League of Cities. Our headquarters is in Tallahassee. We have a branch office in Orlando. Shwanda Barnett is here with me tonight. She is one of our league ambassadors. And we thankfully are based, didn't mean to hit that, thankfully based in Orlando because it's a long drive from Tallahassee, right? The league is, in addition to being an association, a very entrepreneurial organization in that we have developed a number of programs to help cities in areas where they need help. That's what enables most of us to get to do what we do. We happen to be the largest municipal league in the United States. We're very proud of that. Can anybody tell me the only state that doesn't have a municipal league? Because there's 49 of us, and then there's the National League of Cities. So if you were on Jeopardy, and I was getting you ready for Jeopardy, right? The answer is, what is Hawaii? Because Hawaii doesn't have municipalities except for Honolulu, so there's nothing to join. Each island functions as a county. Honolulu is the only municipality, which means we can't have the National League of Cities meeting there. So <laughs> bummer, OK? OK. We are a member of the National League of Cities, and we're actually two years older than they are. Many of the state leagues are older than the national group. But similarly, we needed a united voice on the national level as well. So of course, you create a National League of Cities. All right, so some of the things we're going to do tonight is a little bit of a civics refresh. So again, get your arm ready to raise. Who had a high school civics class? Branches of government, all those things, OK? Almost everybody raised their hand. Who in the group, though, civics class, that it included what is a county and what is a city? Let me see those hands. Only a few. That's one of the reasons I'm here tonight. Your average Florida voter, my average Florida voter, scares me a little when I think that they're not doing their homework and they don't have a good, strong grounding in civics. So that's one of the reasons for tonight as well. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the state of cities in Florida collectively with some information that we've gathered. And then again, I hope you'll ask me some questions at the end. I covered the little bit about the league. You've already seen that. So our Constitution provides that every inch of Florida will be in a substate. We happen to use the word county. There are states that use parish, right, Louisiana, and a couple of states that use the word borough, and not the donkey kind, right, the Manhattan kind, but all of them function as a sub-state. And Florida's constitution is very clear, so we have 67 counties. They must do what the state tells them to do locally. Much like your, your bank has branch offices, my bank has branch offices, Florida as a state has 67 branch offices. It's a good way to think of that part of the process. I'm going to talk later about home rule, which impacts the counties, though. So in addition to being an arm of the state, they also have local decision-making authority. But they did not always have that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We also, in the Florida Constitution, provide for school districts. Florida's had a really interesting history. And just up the street, I know you've got one of your historic schools preserved. Did you know that at one time, Florida schools were run by the sheriffs? Lasted one year. The sheriffs went screaming to the legislature and said, take it back. We, we'll do whatever you want, but take back the schools, OK? The schools in Florida have been run through churches. They've been run through different volunteers. But the process we have in place now provides one per county, so 67. However, on the side of the bus, when it says Palm Beach, there are a lot of people who pick up the phone and call the county and not the school district because they don't realize it's a district government. So this is part of that confusing layers in the discussion. The legislature, apart from the Constitution, has also created a number of special districts. And we had a Senate president who gave them a really great name. Dempsey Barron from the Panhandle, from Panama City, said these are the shadow governments because they're all around you all the time and you don't know they're there. 1,600 plus special districts, but all of us live in at least one. 
which is a water management district. There's nowhere you can go in Florida that you're not in a water management district. And in your meeting earlier today, I heard mention of the one that we're in, which is the South Florida Water Management District. There are five of them. They cover every inch of the state. But in addition, there are hospital district, inland navigation districts. There are mosquito control districts. Can you really control mosquitoes? I know, we all work at it, right? If you can name the purpose, there's probably a district for it. And as a result, that's why we have 1,600 of them. In addition, the Constitution provides for the only optional level, which is the municipal level. These others are proscribed for you, and you can think of them in terms of layers. And then at the top, you have to choose. Am I going to live inside a municipality, or am I going to own my business inside a municipality, or am I going to be outside the municipality? So that's our basis in law. Now, in Florida, and wherever else you might have lived, there might have been a legal difference between names like city, town, or village. It could have been a population threshold. It could have been the size, right? In Florida, we don't care. Our smallest city this year in the census, Marineland, with 15 people, there's more of us in the room tonight than Marineland has in the whole city, right? But they call themselves a city. We've got a village of 66,000 right here in your county, Wellington, right? And we've got a town, Davie, down in Broward, that's 110,000. They like town. They think it describes them better. So it's an aesthetic choice. All of them by constitution are municipalities, which is a tough word, right? But if you break it down, muni, the many, pality, governing themselves, couldn't be more true to home rule just by the letters, municipality. So even though it's tough to spell, I'm gonna use it a few times tonight, bear with me. We usually just interchangeably say city, town, or village because in Florida and under our constitution, they're equal in power. Other states I've lived in, legally, a city could do the things on a menu, a town could only do this. Or a city had access to certain taxes, a town did not. In other states, there's something called a township, right? Up in New England, we don't have those. We don't classify anything like that like other states do. So we're a little bit unique that way. If you look at our numbers, we're currently at 411, which I like because it's kind of like what's the 411 on the 411. Our range, you see, what's the guess on that 970,000? You think somebody's going to guess Miami, but it isn't. It's Jacksonville. And if you're ever on Jeopardy, the city with the largest square miles in the lower 48 states is also Jacksonville. Even if they hadn't taken over the whole county, they would still be 741 square miles, which is a really big city, right? And so, unfortunately, up in Alaska, one of their cities annexed a mountain range, and we can't beat that, okay? But in the lower 48, it's Jacksonville, okay? Look at the median, though. Two-thirds of our cities have a population of 10,000 or less. Florida's not known for being a state with really large cities. You get outside the top 10 in population, and it drops considerably. So just keep in mind, right at 60% of our cities are 10,000 in population or less. And with that median, think about all the littler cities. When I mention marine land, why are they even a city? Because they wanted to be right? They had services they wanted to provide unique to themselves, and they chose to incorporate. You know? And I know that Marineland, by the way, is going to grow. They've just approved their first condo building. So this population, the next time we give this talk, it'll be bigger. All right. The other interesting things for Florida, we are more suburban in character than urban. The rural parts of Florida usually are not inside a city limit, particularly if you think about farming agriculture and silviculture, our tree crops. They really don't need to be inside a municipality's boundaries, so they're not, most common in Florida. And our biggest boom in forming cities was right after World War II. Remember, everybody returning from having served around the world, they'd done their training in Florida, and I think they fell in love with Florida, and they made the decision to come back. All the incorporations were because people needed services. And one of the things to think about with the municipal level of government is that we are service delivery machines. 24-7, 365, 
that's what municipal governments do. Now, in terms of what we represent statewide, it's been about 50-50 unincorporated versus incorporated since the 1970s, which coincides with the creation of cable TV and where it could be located. And when Florida made the decision that cable could be in the unincorporated area, it shifted from 70% municipal population and 30% unincorporated to about 50-50, and we've been there ever since. So it's quality of life and level of service that drives most people to choose to live inside a city, right? And it can be confusing too, because I'm sure people have a mailing address that says something, but that isn't really where they live. I spent 25 years working for the league in Tallahassee and lived inside the city. Every election, someone would be at a polling place saying, well, this is my address, don't I get to vote? In the city election, they may have had a Tallahassee name and a zip code, but they weren't inside the city limits. And there's only one city in their county, by the way, so it's a really clear distinction. Whereas here in Palm Beach, you guys know you have the most municipalities in any county in Florida, 39. And that's more than Broward, and that's more than Miami-Dade. So people here are majority in an incorporated setting, the majority of the population. You could look across the state over at Charlotte County, for example, where 90% are unincorporated. And there's only one municipality, Punta Gorda. So interesting contrast. We've talked a little bit about the rural as well. Does anybody think this last census was accurate? Because I know a number of cities are going to be appealing the count because they think it was under. Florida's a tough state to count, just so you know. But I think we're going to see some massaging on some of these census numbers. So the data that you see, our numbers are pretty good, but I think there's going to be some tweaks in the next uh, year. So with Florida, if you know something about, obviously, Delray Beach, because you do, you have a charter. Well, what's a charter? What's that mean? The charter is the municipal constitution. It, it comes from the Latin for contract and specifically has been used really for the last 2,000 years to mean a social contract. And in describing it, it's we the people want to self-govern and here's the way we're gonna do it. It's the broad framework. We don't put a lot of detail into it. The details are gonna live in your policies and in the city's ordinances, which are its laws. The forms of government were alluded to earlier when Terrence was giving his talk, and we'll take a minute and, and just discuss those. On the legislative body, though, first, our smallest city council is only three. In a really little city, it's hard to do five, <laughs> okay? But five is the most common number. It's what we often see. We've got some sevens all the way up to Jacksonville at 19. So the next time you guys think about the size of a city council, remember that Jacksonville basically has a small legislature, and that's what its city council is, okay? But we do have a couple of the threes. Now on the forms, council manager or commission manager, we use those terms interchangeably, that is about 285 out of the 411 in terms of form. It is not only the most prevalent in Florida, it's the most prevalent in the United States. It's becoming the most prevalent in other countries as well because of the expertise that comes with the manager's knowledge and the fact that the council most times is part-time. So expecting expertise in the elected official can be tough because they have the passion and the vision and the energy, but they may not know, for example, how many parts per billion of cryptosporidium can be in potable drinking water. And that's what you handle or you expect the manager to know in hiring the people who are gonna do your water service, for example. So when we talk about the other forms, here in Palm Beach, council manager is again the most prevalent. You hear these terms, weak mayor, strong mayor. The council name always comes first, council or commission. The issue with the mayor, that strong and that weak have nothing to do with their personality, okay? It's what does the charter say? Is this a mayor who's gonna hire staff and prepare the budget and control the agenda and perhaps have a veto over the legislation of the council? Those are considered strong characteristics. In the weak mayor form, the mayor and the members of the council collectively make the decisions and the mayor simply has the gavel at a meeting 
and gets to kiss babies and cut ribbons ceremonially, okay? Which is wonderful, but it means the council collectively is making all the decisions without the position of a professional manager. As a result, that council gets really well versed in the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality. In terms of the numbers, I mentioned that it's about 285 out of the 411 with the council manager or commission manager form. 45 are council strong mayor, 80 are council weak mayor, but not one of them is over 20,000 in population. Tend to be smaller cities. Then we have this wonderful thing called a hybrid, which means they took a little bit from all the forms, wrote the charter that they wanted, and it works great for them, but you can't put them in a category, and we have a handful of those. So Florida's a wonderful state that way. You may have lived in a state where charters were only given to cities of a certain size, or that you had to appeal to your legislature for a charter, and we don't do that in Florida either. The charter is the people's document written and adopted by them as part of the act of incorporation. So back when Delray Beach became a city, the charter was part of it from day one, and the charter continues to be part of it for all time. And I think that's a wonderful thing because that document is what you start with and it's where you stand. It's often where you end in your conversations because it dictates what's going to be. The ordinances help you in terms of the law stay more current with the time. You can amend them as time goes by. And then the internal policies that the council also adopts, that's what guides staff in their day-to-day -day work. So all of these together are important, but without a firm foundation, you're not standing very well. And that's why the charter matters so much. There also are, um, okay, I mentioned that part, right. We have charter officers within. Every city has a clerk or a clerk type of position. Sometimes the title will vary. We've got treasurer clerks in Florida. We've got some other titles with that. It's more than records under a clerk's responsibility and their, their job descriptions vary across the state. Every city's charter also usually mentions the attorney and that's a very important position. Whether that person is an employee of the city or is kept through contract, it's a very important role. Some of the things just for the civics catch up in terms of the municipal finances, it isn't the property tax that funds most things a city does. The, when we average cities, which is tough, but in the average, and you look at the pie chart, half of the pie is charges for service or what we call user fees. It's garbage pickup. It's me taking tennis lessons, really bad tennis player, by the way, really bad. Tennis lessons from City Parks and Rec. It is the things that you can measure and buy. Those user fee charges for service, half of a budget for a reason. Remember, we're all in a county, we're all in a school district, we're all in at least one special district. By the time you look at tax burdens and come up, the municipal level is where the fee lives because it's service driven and you're there for that service delivery. Now, I'm not saying the taxes aren't important because they are and ad valorem or the property tax is the one that is usually the larger segment for cities that choose to levy it. We have a handful of cities in Florida that do not levy the property tax. So you've got some taxing sources as well and most cities also receive intergovernmental funds as we go from the state government. And right now, for example, with ARPA, the American Recovery Plan Act, there are municipal governments in Florida receiving federal dollars to use for projects as part of the Recovery Act. So intergovernmental money can be a very important part of a city budget as well. Just a quick look at the finances. Our most common services, we do a survey every year at the league called City Stats. And we love to be able to collect the information because the legislature, when we go to be that one united voice, right? They'll say, well, how many cities do that? Boo, we better know, right? In the early days before we could survey, it was a lot of phone calls. Are you guys doing water, wastewater, storm water, reuse water, okay? Parks and rec, no parks and rec? Are you doing your own code enforcement? Are you doing building inspection or, do, or is the county doing all the building inspection? Which way is it? Is there a police department? Do you contract with the sheriff? Is there fire service or are you with, for example, a fire district or county fire? 
whatever the case may be, we gather the statistics and you see some of the responses, the comprehensive plan is the thing that every city has in common because by law, all Florida municipalities have to have a comprehensive plan. So as a result, we all have one thing in common and from there the lists can vary. Many cities do what we call full service, the full menu of things, and we have cities that comprehensive planning and land use is the reason they incorporated because they wanted to not be what was next door and they didn't want to get swallowed by what was on the other side of them either through annexation, so they incorporated and the rest of the services are through contract. So it really varies across Florida, as you can imagine. When we talk about quality of life and service delivery as the two biggest reasons for people to want to be inside of a city, think about the things that make a difference. When you were house hunting, you probably didn't say to the real estate agent, I need to be inside the city limits. What draws you is what you visually see, curb and gutter, sidewalk, the patrol of a police car, knowing the location of a fire station, seeing abundant parks and recreation opportunity, cleanliness, well lit. Whatever the things were that ticked off your list, you might have also been looking for school district, right? Access to shopping. The planning of an area, how well planned was it? If those are the factors that draw someone to a city, then service delivery is what usually keeps them there. And when we think about the invisible services on that list, the 24-7 of I turn a tap, I flush a toilet, I put garbage at the curb, and it just goes somewhere, and it just happens. Well, it isn't magic. And most of us know if we've ever sat through a city council meeting, we know the level of detail and work it takes to have these things delivered 24-7, 365 days a year. One of the things I think the pandemic, when people started staying home, I think it was really evident what some of those services were because we really got the chance to look at them. Some of the things we talk about, I'm gonna share some best practices that our surveys are showing. We talked a lot during the Great Recession about shared services. Two cities could do something more cost effectively than each of them doing it separately. Well, you know what? Some of those were great ideas 10 and 15 years ago now. We've continued them forward. Taking advantage of technology is another way that we see our cities really improving things, what they can teach and show, for example, on the website, how they can engage their citizens through the web. Issues of benchmarking, if a city has this many resources and does something a certain way, can you compare to other cities? If you do it with peer cities, it's usually successful. It helps you have a goal to measure toward and it helps you evaluate every year what's going well or what might need work. The issues themselves for city and knowing the landscape and the context, here in Palm Beach with 40 municipalities, can Delray Beach look right next door and see something identically the same? Nope. So who are gonna be the peers for Delray? How are you gonna, how is your staff gonna do the homework to know how something's gonna impact just Delray? That takes a lot of work. Staff spends a lot of time doing research and comparison. What about public-private partnerships and finding friends along the way? That's one of the best ways for cities today to find success. I'll give you some examples in a minute on that with just school districts, for example, but city-county partnerships, for example, or working with a company that really wants to be located in your city. One of the things that Terrence mentioned when he was speaking in terms of staff and introducing the people that are here tonight, for the professional development and the municipal expertise that every city wants, you're looking at training, sometimes licensures, certifications, continuing education, staying on top of the game, it's a competitive job market. Every city is competing so that they can have some of those best and brightest come to work for them. And just in Florida, the competition is tough, let alone when you think about the Southeast or the US. So the professionalism of staff and helping them to retain that professionalism, government is only getting more complex. I mentioned cryptosporidium and drinking water, a hundred years ago, we weren't worried about that, right? Your water system tests for hundreds of contaminants every hour on the hour to be sure that it's pure. And I travel with bottled water to drink and it hasn't been tested at all. 
I'm really a city tap water girl. I really am, and I'd much prefer to fill a jug up at home than go buy a bottle of water that hasn't been tested anywhere. Well, that takes a professional staff, and it takes really strict standards and following them. So that's a critical issue. All right, so some of the things, too, to know. How many people move here every day? Okay, you said too many. I heard you. <laughs> I heard you. This is the latest number out of the governor's office, and that tourism number, all those tourists drive on roads, flush toilets, take long showers, and produce garbage. So the impact, and those are only the tourists we can count. That's not your aunt and uncle who drove down and stayed on your fold-out couch. These are the people we can count. Now, this is a pre-pandemic number. I haven't seen the really good pandemic numbers, OK? But even in a pre-pandemic number, we're already hearing that records are being broken and we're back to the, to the numbers. So on any given day in Delray Beach, who's here and who are you serving? It's a huge number beyond your population. Not to mention the people who simply drive in from other cities because their work is here or their fun is here. Where they want to spend their time and where they want to spend their money is here. So what are some of our cities really struggling with because of that growth? Well, the water and having enough of it and being able to treat it. The roads, which are always in need of repair because weather here is tough and we know that. And we've always been playing catch up in Florida since World War II. There's a number from the National Engineering Association that the US is $3 trillion behind on infrastructure. And even with the money coming through ARPA, it is a drop in the bucket to that number. That three trillion keeps me awake at night because this is my business and I'm a little government geek, okay. But it's a number that keeps me awake at night because when I lived in Tallahassee, I drove regularly under a bridge that said 1911. And I kept thinking, that's before my grandparents were born, <laughs> let alone my parents and let alone me. Let the bridge stand, let the bridge stand, little prayer as you drive. And I think about the rest of the infrastructure, not just in Florida, but around the US, we're, we're playing catch up when we're gonna be for a long, long time. But the demands when you add tourist to resident really are highly felt in an area like this because you're a destination place. And people come here for that beauty, to enjoy that beauty. And there's a price to be paid when you're a popular location. And we pay it through the solid waste side, the water in the wastewater side, just meeting the service delivery side as well. There's a big price to be paid for that. The expansion of utilities. Where are we going to site the new landfills, guys? Where are we going to put it? Because you know nobody wants a landfill next door to them. What are we going to do with our garbage? In the panhandle, they're shipping it out of state to states that buy it because they make money off of it. So then garbage is going out of Florida on I-10 to other southern states. But we are going to have to do something with all the garbage. And recycling isn't really working right now because there's not a big enough market for all the recyclables. So other than reducing your own personal amount, what are we going to do? It's a genuine question. I don't have the answer. I'm looking to bright people around this room and all around Florida who will have the answer. So the intergovernmental picture, the story I wanted to tell, cities in large part and some counties are paying for the guardians at the schools. After what happened, obviously in Parkland, it was many, many trigger points around the US and I use that word intentionally because of what happened that every school would then get a guardian position. However, only a little bit of money was put with it. So every city takes its pie chart and divides it again and says, okay, it's worth it. This is the right reason. We'll pay for it, but something else you have to give up once you put that money in. Intergovernmentally, very few Floridians understand when a city and a county step up to pay for something that way. Or one of your special districts needs help with something and a city and a county step up. The intergovernmental layers aren't neat and, and tidy this way. They're more wavy because there's all these points of interaction. Nothing in Florida happens without governments working together hand in hand, side by side, lots of planning, 
Think about emergency response. We automatically think hurricane, right? The county runs the EOC. The cities contribute their people. There's rescue missions, et cetera. What if it's a natural disaster? What if it's just a tornado? What if trees go down in an area because of a microburst? All the crews come together. Everybody backs everybody else up. And we work together intergovernmentally. And that's a really big part of Florida's success, not just in hurricanes, but whenever anything happens. Think about the response with the pandemic. Where are we gonna test people? How are they gonna wait in line? What's got a big enough parking lot to put 500 cars a day in it, or 1,000 cars a day, or 10,000 cars a day? Intergovernmentally, everybody gets together, you make it happen. That's a big part of Florida's success. Now, I'm gonna take a minute and talk about home rule and those words mandates and preemptions. We have this thing called home rule because Florida got rid of something called Dillon's rule. Prior to 1968, Florida was one of the many US states that had Dillon's rule. Came from a judge out of Colorado and Iowa whose decision went all the way up to the US Supreme Court but was not considered by the Supreme Court and they named it after the judge. What he wrote is that every city or county derives all of its authority only from the state and no city or county may act in any way without state permission first. So when you were a child, you may have played the game, either Mother May I or Simon Says. That's what this was like for your county and your city. Imagine wanting to put up stoplights and signals when the first of these things called horseless carriages came to Florida in the early 1900s. The horse and buggy folk are over here. All of a sudden, here comes this thing that runs and it's loud and it does an appalling 35 miles an hour. Man was never meant to go that fast, right? 35 miles an hour, I want a stop sign and I want a signal. But no mayor and no county could do it until they waited for an even numbered year because our legislature didn't meet every year. They had to go up to Tallahassee get a bill and get permission. Pretty soon the counties are asking in groups. Counties with this size population now ask for permission to do this. Did you say mother may I? Okay, take a step, right? Simon says we want a police department. Okay, so you wait three to five years, you get a bill filed and you get permission. And you may think I'm kidding, but South Carolina is still a Dillon's rule state. And I encourage you to call one of their city official and ask what it's like, because I talk to their League of Cities all the time to get stories. One of the ones they're waiting on, it's five years. They've been waiting five years for collective permission for municipal services, five years. Is that efficient? Is that effective? So in 1968, Floridians put this into the Constitution, let me go back, put into the Constitution the reverse of Dillon's rule, which said any or city or county can enact a law of its own so long as that law does not conflict with state or federal law. Boom, home rule. There's only a handful of true home rule states in the US and we're one of them. And when I say preemption or mandate, that's when the state narrows home rule and they pass a law that says every county must, every city must. And in doing that, they erode the corners of home rule. And we're not back to Dillon's rule, but there are days that it can feel like it, right? And you can name any kind of issue. I, I, can, I can tell you a good one is the issue of how can you trim trees or cut down trees on your own property and getting permission for that. We're working really hard to get that permission back because a couple of years ago, the legislature took the authority, said no city or county can decide it, we'll decide it at the state level. Well, it wasn't going to really happen and it wasn't going to be enforced. So we're working to get that authority back to the local level. Now, with a mandate, which is my next slide, the preemption issue, let me do that one first. The preemption is you no longer have that authority. It's gone. The mandate is regardless of authority, you must do this. Now, mandates usually come with a good idea. We counted every person who got COVID in Florida if we could. That was a mandate from the state. It went to the county public health office, right? And you saw the data, you saw the numbers, right? And it all went up to the Centers for Disease Control. Good idea, but somebody had to do it. And who was gonna pay for it? 
some federal money did eventually come down to help the states so that they could you know, contain the cost, but that still means that it had to be done. We count the Zika cases for mosquito bites, right? It still happens. They're not completely gone. We count measles. We count mumps. We count all kinds of diseases. Those are things that came with a good idea. The mandate made sense, but somebody still has to pay for it. Now, those happen to be county examples, but they're very real to most people, and you can understand them. The preemption piece, once the authority's lost, it's really hard to get it back. You don't often find within one political span of time that decision going from A to B and back to A, right? So a group like ours, Florida League of Cities, Florida Association of Counties, we work very hard on preemptions and on mandates because being a home rule state's a very precious thing. And as I had on the slide before, I can actually get home rule down to four words. Local decisions locally made. So if you're in an elevator with somebody and you wanted to describe home rule to them, you don't have to read them the Constitution. You can say local decisions locally made. And as you meet the candidates running for your House and Senate seats this year, it's an election year, ask them what they think about home rule. Ask them if they believe in it as a constitutional concept and will they stand by it rather than set it aside. It's a critical issue because for Delray Beach to be Delray Beach, you've got to have home rule so that you can continue to be a unique and wonderful community. Otherwise, it's one size fits all, and you might as well cut us out of a, like a, a, you know, a brownie pan. We're all going to be exactly the same size and exactly the same shape and look exactly the same way because that's what one size fits all does, right? So just a little bit there on preemptions and mandates. No discussion is complete without that. I've already talked through so many of these municipal issues in terms of the things that we struggle with every day, but I will point out that citizen engagement piece. How do you find out what the public wants? Some people do surveys. Some people hold town hall meetings. Sometimes the city council goes to every single homeowners association meeting and asks and asks and asks, right? In this day and age, even with a digital feed in, are we hearing what the people want? That's a constant, steady demand. And if they don't know what the city does, do they know what to ask is the other piece to it. So the rest of these challenges you understand very well. And now, questions and discussion. I hope, Terrence, I used the time appropriately. You did. All right. So what do you want to ask? Please, please, questions. Should we pass the mic? Would that be easier? So it's recorded? OK, there we go. Commissioner Ryan Bowles, then. What, is, what are the most common misconceptions or frequently asked questions that, that you get from, from residents or that you hear? I don't want them to reverberate, so I'll walk over here. That's a great question, Commissioner. Thank you. One of them is, by my mailing address, this is where I live. Why am I not then involved in this city, able to vote, able to be on a board or a committee? Another is from business owners. If I own a business in a city, I ought to be able to vote. That's not the city's decision. That's Florida election law. So it's a different issue in terms of who made that law, but we spend a lot of time doing that educational level. I think the, the other big misconception is that cities have unlimited money. Every city's rich. And when you show cities a budget and you show them what a dollar of property tax gets divided into, that's one of the most amazing light bulb moments that I ever see is just taking somebody through that process or comparing their city property tax to their annual cable bill. That blows the socks off most people because what they're spending for cable is vastly larger than what their city, now I'm not talking about city plus county plus school district taxes, just their city taxes. And usually the answer back is, I had no idea. So I'd say those are probably my top three. Other questions? Stump me with something hard, come on. Everybody, Shirley Johnson. How can we engage the citizenry, county, municipality, town, 
to understanding, and unfortunately, I would love to have seen this room just packed with our residents. They don't know that they're about to or have been experiencing home rule dis dissolution, I guess is the right or way. Or home rule challenges. Home room challenges, mandates, preemptions, daily, monthly, yearly. Our legislature is clawing back work that the citizenry voted to have home rule since 1968 mm -hmm. that in another five, ten years, I predict we're going to be right back where we started. Well, I love that question because one of my questions for you in, in return is, do you hold a Citizens Academy in Delray Beach where citizens can come? That is one of the most successful things that cities do on an educational piece. The other, on your website, have the question posed, what's home rule? Why can Delray Beach adopt its own laws and then answer it, right? And after the legislative session, so that it's on your record, talk through what was a mandate this year, what was a preemption, how people voted, and, and what passed because we're all in the educational game together. In, when you think about all the places people can go to get their information today, that's what we're really up against, is getting the right story out told the right way. I think the other, in addition to citizens' academies, do you have a youth council so that your high school kids get a flavor for this? Do you and the other members of the council and department directors, most cities set up a speaker's bureau of some kind, Go out during city government week every October, see how many groups you can hit and talk to. The other, if you've got Kiwanis and Rotary and Elks and Lions and all the other groups, ask to be on their agenda every year without fail, both to tell them your budget story and what a dollar of city money provides, as well as reminding them of all the city services. Those are some of the best. Right, at an HOA meeting, right. And I think the HOAs are a good outreach. Most of them have a website. If you get to post to it and be in people's newsletters or something where they'll get their eyes on it, how many emails a day are we all deleting without even opening? I'm so guilty. <laughs> I'll put myself right there. But you get me something catchy, I'll open it, I'll read it. It becomes part of what I understand. So I mentioned how many people are moving here a day. Think about our city councils, like this wonderful commission right here, right? Okay, there's 2,270 in Florida, and 700 of them turn over every year. Constant learning curve just to understand what's ad valorem mean, right? And what's municipal, and what's home rule. So the learning curve is constant in the city level, and it's constant statewide. And I, I think the more we can get out and talk group to group, relationship building is the best way we're going to have for the discussion on home rule. But thank you for the question. Do you think it would be a sizable rise since the commissioners in most of the cities may not be full time? Um, that there is a position. I'm sorry. It's everybody can. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that we have an a position in the city that that's that person's main responsibility to go out and educate it'd be hard for one person to probably do all of it in any a city of any given size but you mentioned the point most councils and commissions are part-time mayors in a handful of the cities are full-time who is going to take on that educational component and my answer is a little bit of everybody because, for example, if you represent a district and you aren't elected at large, you might work really hard within your district, but what's happening citywide can be part of that question. So the idea of a speaker's bureau, and you make the calendar, you look at every group you can possibly hit, and then you look to staff as well as the elected officials and say, who's going to hit each of these meetings and sing the city song, which I use in kind of a, a silly way to say it, but it's a really critical piece. Everybody needs to hear this information. And intergovernmentally, there are county citizen academies. The school boards try to bring people through as well. And I don't even know what the 1,600 special districts are doing. But most people don't even know that they exist, let alone that they're paying a tax or a fee to them. So it's a really big learning curve. I think the bottom line in all of this, you want a smarter consumer for all of those city services. You want a smarter consumer of the government itself. From that, we get a better Florida. 
So it's a worthwhile goal. It's just not an easy way to get there. Educationally, the minute you cross the state lines, fly in, or come by boat, nobody hands you a civics test and says, you can stay if you pass this, right? Kind of wish we did, but you only have to do that for the driver's license, so yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, I uh, just started here in Delray six years ago, and prior to that I was in Miramar 30 years. Um, was there when Miramar was very small and, and grew, grew. And Miramar's huge now, yes. It is, yes. And we built a lot of our infrastructure through impact fees. Mm -hmm. But I come here and we're already built out. There is no impact fees. But we do a lot of redevelopment. And have you ever heard of any type of redevelopment impact fees? Because redevelopment does impact us. I'll give you a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, there was a parking lot, and then now we have a four-story hotel there now, which is an impact to police and fire and of course public works and utilities. Transportation But planning. we have no yes. way to help. That. That's an impact that wasn't there before. The density is higher. We have no way to generate revenue for more staff or more equipment. So I've always been racking my brains asking Anthea and everybody can, can ask, is there such a thing as a redevelopment impact fees or another way we can get some type of revenue from that? Other than the tax increment financing mechanisms that are used by community redevelopment agencies that are involved in the day-to-day -day redevelopment, whether at the county or the municipal level, I'm not aware of that having ever been created. Because you are in a charter county, something like that might not only need county approval, but it might have to be adopted by the legislature. And you've got experts here from the redevelopment side that can probably better answer that question than I can. I know the issue of trying to capture the impact is, is critical, mm -hmm. and it should be for more than just areas being newly developed, but I don't think Florida's there yet in terms of something that's been statutorily authorized. Uh, yes, sir. Website, don't you, that talks about some of the projects you're working on to influence uh, legislation. To work with legislators, Cal yes. We're floridaleagueofcities.com. We wanted flc.com, but the fishing lure company beat us to it. So we, you have to, flo if you type in flcities.com, it'll take you there. Just remember the FL and the cities. But thank you. And we provide bill summaries, and um, that's where you were on. Right. Exactly, and you can you can see the legislative information not only from this session but past sessions as well. So thank you for that for that opportunity to plug our website. So all right, well thank you very much for including the league tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Len Tipton. Oops, it wrote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn Tipton. Once again, a round of applause for Florida League of Cities, Lynn Tipton, for the education. We have two other formal presentations this evening. However, before we proceed in that regard, I wish to offer publicly that I'm extremely grateful to all five elected officials for their support and direction in encouraging educational outreach via streaming and other avenues in which we can do so. Given that, I'd like to give the elected officials an opportunity to briefly offer their insights as we finalize the program if there's an interest to do so. Please feel free, ladies and gentlemen. Well, once again, much appreciated to all five elected officials representing the city of Derry Beach, Florida. And part of Lynn's presentation, Ms. Tipton's presentation, touched on briefly the role and function of community redevelopment agencies. They have their purpose, particularly in organizations or communities such as the Delray Beach that does experience a great deal of redevelopment, more redevelopment as opposed to new development, which is the dynamic of this community. Delray Beach is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 90% plus build out. Therefore, our principal focus relative to redevelopment is the order of the day. Likewise, we've made a part of the presentation to offer an update in terms of the role and function of the Delray Beach Community Redevelopment Agency. And thus, Renee Jada Singh is blessed to have us with the presentation in that regard because that does address a number of issues and concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, Renee Jada Singh, Executive Director, Delray Beach Community Redevelopment Agency. 
Thank you, Terrence, and thank you all for having me tonight. Um, a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so thank you, Lynn, for your wonderful presentation. You touched on special districts. That's what we are. We are a dependent special district of the city. Um, we were created in 1985 by the city of Delray Beach in Palm Beach County to eliminate slum and blight within our boundaries, which are from I-95 to the beach and up and down on Federal Highway North and South. So CREs that are, are in existence for a limited period of time, between 40 to 60 years, depending on when you were created. So since we were created in 1985, our sunset date um, is 2039. So we have 17 years left. And to some of our board members, that's something you're going to hear me talk about a lot lately, because we are in our final third, essentially, of our existence. So what are we doing with our next 17 years is kind of the outlook that I want us to try to focus on for our time remaining. Um, and so CREs are created pursuant to um, Chapter 163, Part 3 of the Florida Statutes for certain conditions. So there has to be the presence of substandard inadequate structures, shortage of affordable housing, or inadequate infrastructure, all for the purpose of increasing the tax base. So at one time, I, I saw slides that Delray was once Delray back then, and that's why the CRE was created, to eliminate that dull ray. And I can assure you that it's not dull anymore. We are the happening place, everybody wants to be here, but there are still areas that need to be redeveloped in our community. And that's what our next 17 years is going to be. I'm gonna say it again, 17 years. Um, and as Lynn mentioned, we are a dependent special district. There are more than 1,600 in the state of Florida, and the Department of um, Economic Opportunity website it gives you a full list of the, uh, the areas, um, the boundaries, all the websites. It's a very robust website, but it's all listed there. Our CRE is governed by a board. Our board here is the mayor, the city commissioners, and also two independent members. So when you see our meetings taking place, you may see the city commissioners, but they're functioning in a very different capacity. They are not city commissioners. They are CRA board members. That's a, that's a very important fact to note, that they are wearing a very different hat. They are subject to sunshine, that's what governs us all, but when they sit as city co CRA commissioners, they are on the CRA, not city. Next question, how are we funded? That's something that came up about our uh, funding in Lim's presentation. So our funding is incremental revenue. It's not a tax, we are not a ta special taxing district, so people who live in our district do not pay an additional tax for the CRA. The, we receive funds that are incremental. So you take our base year of 1985, and we receive a portion of the funds above what comes into the city and the county from 1985. We receive 95% of that, and the city retains 5% for administrative functions. So important to note, CRAs do not collect a tax. And also another important note is that we, are at, we act underneath a plan. Our redevelopment plan is our Bible. That is our guiding book that tells us exactly what we're doing, with the projects that we're working on. And right now we are going through a plan amendment process to look at our plan to make sure that, you know, that everything that's happening there is current and up to date. There are quite a few things that we've accomplished, I'm happy to report, and those will be moved to the completed section of our plan, and we're looking to add new things. So we will have a public outreach meeting for our plan amendment in May, I believe it's May 19th. So please look out for that information, we're gonna be sharing it. We encourage everyone to come and give information for that, um, because we haven't updated since about, I think, six years, so it's time. Generally, every five to seven years is good practice to update your redevelopment plan. Currently, our plan goes through seven overall um, needs that are very important for us. Number one, removal of silman blight. Number two, land use, also economic development, affordable housing, downtown housing, infrastructure, and recreational cultural facilities. So our plan meant we'll look at all of those seven needs to determine if those are still relevant. And right now, we do have a lot of interesting projects happening. Some of them, well, a few of them you'll see on this slide. The top picture was a um, groundbreaking that we just recently did, conducted for 98 Northwest 5th Avenue. So that's the um, business corridor in the Northwest Southwest neighborhoods that we've been focusing really heavily to bring back and in, invest into that area. So this project is well underway. If you drive down 5th right now, um, the building is actually partially demolished. You'll see half of the building is gone, which is wonderful because we're gonna be building it back up. So that's an exciting project that we're working on. Right below that, Corey Jones Isle, it's 10 single family homes that are workforce housing that we recently completed with the Delray Beach Community Land Trust. And they're all occupied, beautiful homes that are developed in the Southwest neighborhood. 
Also, what's not on the slide is the 20 single family homes or single family lots that we sold to Pulte Homes to develop workforce housing also in the Southwest neighborhood. And those are under construction. We will have a um, construction celebration, if you will, next week. We want everyone to come out and have the opportunity. Instead of seeing a groundbreaking, we thought to do something a little bit different this time and see something under construction. So there are all 20 lots are being worked on. Five of them now are built with roofs on top. So you'll be able to come next week on Friday to the site at 10 a.m. and see the construction in progress and come and just have a little fun and celebrate for the afternoon. And other picture is a little vehicle. So a few years ago, we started working with the city on transportation initiatives. We previously had a trolley service that would travel up and down on Atlantic Avenue to bring people to the businesses from the tri-rail to the beach. Uh, we wanted to do something a little more sustainable, so we looked into these little vehicles you'll see here. Freebie is the car that service that we're using, but it is an electric vehicle. We have six of them running currently that take people to and from the downtown area, so it does two things. We don't have the trolley anymore. However, we do have this vehicle that your trip has to start or stop in downtown, and that was purposely done to encourage development, encourage people to spend money in the downtown area and to visit our, our businesses. So that's pretty much what we're doing. I'd say visit our website to see more information um, about our projects. That's about the CRA and a little bit about me. Um, I truly think that government work is a labor of love. I think it's a very thankless job, I'll be very honest at times. But you have the moments where like you see with the Corey Jones Isle where we get to provide homes for a family that may have been struggling for many years to get their first home or a business like what we hope for 98 Northwest 5th where we'll have business owners that have been really wanting to start their business but just can't get that opportunity. That's where I see at least the CRA fitting in um, and our role as government. It's something unique. It's not something that the city can necessarily do, but we can. We can have those fun projects that really help and impact people's lives every day. And that's what, while it's maybe thankless, I think that a lot of us here feel that those moments are why we do this and why we continue every day to work for this community. And I can say the same pretty comfortably for our DDA partners, city partners, CRA, wonderful people to work with. So um, yeah, that's it. I, service is great. All of our community partners are wonderful and I appreciate being here tonight. Thank you. Oh, questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. A lot of people consider downtown uh, Swinton East. You might want to clarify, if you would, what's downtown. Yes. So it's the Atlantic Avenue, pretty much, and on f North and South Fifth Avenue, the freebie will pick people up and drop people off in that downtown area as well, not just Swinton to the beach. It travels west also. So we see downtown. Not west of I-95. Not west, right, correct, at I-95. We see the downtown starting at I-95 to the beach. You're welcome. Anything else? Any other questions? No, I just want to thank you for your hard work. Oh, thank you. You guys are awesome. Yes, thank you. Always have a smile. Oh, thank you. It's a fun place to work. Yes. <laughs> also, one thing. Our annual report was just re recently issued, so you'll see these floating around. Pass them around. Please share the information. Oh, yes. Sunset. With, you said your sunset with 17 years. What is the possibility that you will be able to extend a couple of more years? Because elimination of slum and blight, I know that the, some of our projects are in need of, that you've done, or that have been done since 1985, or in need of renovation as we speak. That's a good one. So that actually speaks to the home rule discussion we were having previously. A few years ago, uh, the legislature was trying to have all sun CRAs end completely. We would all phase out it. Unless you had debt, you could continue on to service and pay debt. Um, but with the League of Cities assistance, uh, we were able to negotiate to not have that happen. But basically, the legislature said that all CRAs must end at 2039, unless the governing body votes to extend to your full duration. So our full duration would normally be 2045. But it is 2039 by statute. And if part of our plan amendment process will look at that and to see if the, our board would like to extend to our current, our full capacity. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So I want to 
to do this to you. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, Renee, um, how do you um, partner or how, do you offer grant programs? Because I know you, that was one thing you left off, but do you offer, yes. offer grant programs to our um, businesses and to others in yes. the community? Yes, we do. We do. Ha we have several programs. One thing we wanted to highlight in this annual report is the, are the business grants that we've given out. We have site assistance to help with interior build outs. We have rent assistance for businesses newly moving into the area or just opening up. Um, also paint up and signage to give people the opportunity to paint the exterior of their buildings, put signage up. But we highlighted every single one of them that we gave out last year in our annual report. Good question. <laughs> one more, actually, we also have curb appeal. So speaking of grants, we have a curb appeal program that is available for residents in the Northwest Southwest neighborhood. That's up to $15,000 to improve the interior exterior of your homes through painting, landscaping, um, you can do over your um, the, um, driveways, or if you need a ramp, we did recently did a, a senior home that needed a ramp to get into the house, so that was part of the program. So many things we have to do going on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Renee Jada Singh. Our final presentation for today's program, the illustrious Laura Simon, Executive Director of the Delray Beach Downtown Development Authority. Thank you. Thank you. You're well, good evening, everybody. Um, I guess I'm the one standing between you and dinner, so um, I'll try to be long. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so again, I'm Laura Simon. I'm with the Downtown Development Authority, and I'm going to start really just introducing myself. Uh, give a little bit of background of me um, as my, as I am a native to Delray Beach. I raised my hand, born and raised. Um, actually, I was born in Bethesda Hospital, so technically born in Boynton. But um, and I am a proud graduate of Atlantic High School, and um, I am my family has been here since 1911. So we have, I've, as uh, Lynn had mentioned earlier, and we were talking. I feel like it is the city has been washed over me with my family being involved so much in this uh, this time and just being the service that they provided and being the involvement of our of my father my grandfather my great grandfather in this community so it is in my blood and i am proud to be now in the downtown development authority as the executive director since 2010 and i started um, came from private sector, graduated from Clemson University, came back to downtown uh, and worked in, in this, came in this organization from Office Depot Corporate. So it was um, living here, enjoying our town, and always wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, how can I do this? And my dad's like, well, you should work for the DDA. And I said, what is the DDA? And it, it's this behind the scenes organization that does a lot for our community that, um, Many don't know, so I really appreciate this opportunity, and thank you, Mayor and Commissioners and uh, City Manager Moore for bringing this opportunity together for us to explain it and explain what we do as an organization. So the DDA is, was established in 1971, 50 years ago. Uh, last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary, and um, established before the CRA, we were a huge organization as part of coming together to create the CRA. Um, but we started as an organization that was um, around that 1968 time where you could, as a, as a community, come together and lobby the cities and the state to create organizations to govern over communities and downtowns as part of that revitalization. And that's what they did. There was issues going on. The residents, property owners wanted to get, rally together to really have a voice and to create an organization to have a voice. And that's what we are today, to have that voice of downtown and to represent and to make sure that we are um, reinvesting the funds that come in from an Avalorum tax. We levy a tax. We are a special taxing district. And we do reinvest through programs, place ma making. We do marketing and programs and events. We are uh, charged with business development, economic development, and working really closely with our city partners and CRA partners and our Chamber of Commerce to, to keep downtown's health and vitality top of mind. So we are, we are governed by a state statute that was established that outlines our functions and rules and responsibilities. 
We have a um, volunteer board that serves three-year terms that is appointed by the city commission. And there are seven members that serve for the betterment of our community. Mavis Benson is here tonight, so thank you, Mavis, for uh, supporting me and supporting your town. Uh, we also have Peter Arts, who is our chairman. Uh, Mavis is our treasurer. We have uh, Al Costello, who I know is watching, and he is our vice chair, Big Al Stakes. We have um, Mark Dinkler, who is a resident but was former owner of Vince Canning and Tootsie's for 60 years. Their um, business is on Atlantic Avenue. We have Rocco Mangal, who owns Rocco's Tacos, and John Condi, Condi Chiropractic on Atlantic Avenue, and then Frank Frion, who is also a business owner in our, um, in our city. So we are you know, blessed to have, yes, I did, I've been plugging Mavis. Oh, and Mavis is our treasure, Avalon Gallery. She's on Atlantic Avenue. Yes, yeah, sorry, 19 years. So we are, um, we're thrilled to have that, and that is, they are the representation of the downtown. They come and they work hand in hand with our team, who is small but mighty, to make sure that you know, downtown is top of mind when it comes to making decisions um, through our local government and that the residents and the constituents in our community, which as Shirley uh, Commissioner Johnson reminds us that downtown runs from 95 to A1A, which is our district, which expanded twice. Um, and within the core, it's four blocks to the north, four blocks to the south. And all of this can be found on our downtowndarrybeach.com site. So I'll be remiss to say that because there is a lot to tell, as Renee said. Uh, we have a big story to tell for 50 years, obviously, of all the accomplishments and things that we do currently. So always um, check that out and attend our meetings, visit our office, whatever you can do there. So um, we do have, I didn't even, wasn't even paying attention to the slide, but um, we have uh, currently many functions that uh, we reinvest those dollars into, and placemaking is a term in downtowns that, and urban centers, that is really about place management and managing the, the center and making it a place that's livable, that's workable, that is a sociable environment. And we have been that as, as a resort town, a community where people want to visit. Tourism is a huge industry for us, and we like them. Um, however, they definitely have an impact. So for us to be able to continue to um, d devote those resources to making the place look great, feel great, work with our city partners, such as our clean and safe team, uh, through our police department and our city department to make sure that the ambiance in the, the place looks wonderful and they'll want to come back. We do that with our, um, we, we invest annually on ambient lighting, which is the decorative lighting program, so a place looks safe and it feels safe. We also invest in the safety ambassador program. So this is a program that started in 2018 with the leadership of Ryan Boylston when he was on our board um, as a way for us to partner with our city uh, police department, fire department, and community services to manage and be that extra um, eyes and ears for them to handle a lot of the nuisance issues and quality of life issues. So it's a seven day a week program. It is run and operated out of our, our department and as the Downtown Development Authority. They are the yellow shirts. They are, you know, seven days a week, as I said, from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, most times and really handling a lot of, of challenges out there, especially after COVID and as things have gone and grow as to make this place a safe place to be and also handle a lot of uh, customer questions of where do I park, how do I get here, where's this restaurant, so it is a, a public facing uh, investor program as well. So um, we also really work closely with our businesses as we, um, and the place management piece on the clean and code and zoning pieces, we are working closely with uh, Sammy's team. Uh, to be that, that liaison to help manage through those processes and also with Public Works and Missy's team through construction and road closures and working on, on, that, on that side of the house as well. So it's a really great partnership with our downtown management team to make sure that you know, the downtown's functioning well. Some fun things that we do and the really to keep the vibrancy and then the engine running is working in that marketing and programs area. 
We've developed lots of programs over the years to bring our community to downtown to make sure that they know the businesses that are here, that they know how to find that um, place around the corner or discover a new um, dry cleaners even. And that is something that is on always that we're with something that we're handling to make sure that we're keeping that downtown top of mind. So some programs that we've developed is uh, Delray Fashion Week that started um, 10 years ago. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary and uh, in February, and that was done through to showcase our apparel retail that's here. So we highlight our retailers in a fun way, and it is going to be a big success. And thank you, Mayor, for being part of that as well. So. Uh, Savor the Avenue, we just recently did that in March. That that was developed 13 years ago, almost 14 years ago now, to highlight our culinary scene. That is a the nation's longest dining table. We serve over 1,000 people along Atlantic Avenue and has now grown to be a, a really signature event for our community. And we continue to do our um, other programs. We did recently bring back Art and Jazz on the Avenue, so we're excited to do that. That came out this year as an opportunity for us to introduce new residents, um, old residents that have uh, missed the art and jazz, and introduce them to new parts of town, new businesses, and also bring our community back together again after a long time. So that is started in October. We have our next one is May 25th, 6 to 9 on Southeast 3rd Avenue. And then we'll do another one in July, on July 27th, on. Atlantic Avenue, West Atlantic Avenue. So taking it on the road, taking it to different parts of the district to highlight those areas. So those are the fun things that we do, along with many other things that um, are out there just to highlight, again, our community, bring our community together, make it the best place to live, to work, to invest, and just to be a part of, to socialize. You know, it is, as Renee said, it's part of the passion and things that we, you know, we love. I love what I do. I love the city. I mean, I'm partial to it. Um, however, it is, I know our board does as well. Um, we're, we're just proud, and I'm proud to be part of this organization and to continue the legacy that my family's done and um, continue to make, you know, this a great place to be always. So I just encourage everyone that's listening I know there's lots of people listening, but service to your community is really important, and it is something that I took for granted growing up here, but knowing, no, well, my father's 91 years old, and he's still serving his community, and it has done so much work, and we need to continue to do that, so just get involved. Thank you. I was about to facilitate the question part as we conclude the program. Any questions for Executive Director Laura Simon? Gina, I believe Commissioner Johnson has a question. Yes. Not planning on being the questioner of the year, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Laura, for all the wonderful things that you and the DDA does. Um, most people don't even know that you exist mm -hmm. except the businessmen because anytime there's a problem, they come running to you. Um, hopefully to get more of a response than they might get trying to come to the Commission one-on-one -on -one. and you're a great representative for them and hope that you will continue to do so expanding as we expand uh, I think I really wanted to just ask placemaking that sounds really catchy uh, don't know a couple of sentences as to what that is and um, are you sunset so the DDA does not sunset. I'll start with the last question. So we are not sunset. We, we have a statute that is um, a House bill. So it would need to petition the state legislature to disband us. So we could be disbanded, but it would be a vote um, by the constituents. So the next question is placemaking. So placemaking is a downtown management and a um, term that is about the place and about keeping um, taking care of the place, and it's through art, activations, um, ambiance, so decorative features, and clean and safe. Uh, we are unique that the CRA funds our clean and safe uh, team, and a lot of it is because of funding. We're, our, we're only funded by a millage on the district, 
So our budget is a lot less than the CRA's. Uh, we are a $1.3 million budget this year. When I started in 2010, we were $400,000. So we're based on the value. So we've obviously in the past 12 years, we've grown um, a lot in value and a lot of the great work that we've all been doing. Um, so prior, when I first started here, the CRA was funding a lot of our place making items such as decorative lighting, but uh, banners. And as we took on that role, um, we over the years and our budget grew, we, t we pulled that into our um, management area. So we manage the management of keeping the lights on, basically, for our downtown. And it is, it's creating the ambiance. You know, downtowns are special, and it helps with our safety when we have um, a great place that is lit, well lit, and, um, and safe to be in, so. The economic engine is the DDA, along with the CRA, mm -hmm. along, uh, CRA, along with the city. It's one great, because everybody, it's a unit. everyone, like you said, loves to come to Delray. They can't afford to live here. They at least come and play. Thank you. Well, one interesting part, I'm just, you might have to pull this out of me, but um, so one an interesting thing that I caught from Lynn when she was speaking is that you know how municip municipalities have grown, um, or where the county line and Del so Delray is one of those that did grow. Um, as in its boundaries. We were very small. Just when I grew up, I have, my family still lives there, but even Lake Ida was in the county, not in the city. So our, our, you know, our city has expanded. We're small in comparison to some of the others. Uh, however, just having that, you know, again, being in a county versus town. So it's, it's a great thing to understand how we've expanded and uh, in our district, so. Thank you. Laura Simon, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. <coughs> As we close the program, I just wish to reiterate again my appreciation to the elected officials, the Mayor and City Commission, and of course the department directors for your involvement and participation. As this exercise is the genesis or initial catalyst to, to direct additional educational outreach programs to benefit the community and all else concerned. With that tremendous opportunity for the city of Delray Beach, we have a lot to offer, a lot to convey, and as well as our appreciation to the Florida League of Cities for their involvement and participation as well. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Take care and stay well, and continue Team Delray Beach. Take care.